So Adam Llewellyn is back with us this week. He's um, substituting for Evan. Um, and <laughs> he chose a film. And we gave Adam a bit of a brief. And we said, what film did you watch as a kid? Quite a lot growing up that we can talk about on the podcast. So there's me thinking, oh, you know, knowing Adam, it'll, you know, it'll be you know, a good 80s action film or something along those lines. And then he went and picked a film called Bingo. And I will admit, I didn't have a Scooby-Doo what this film was. Uh, sorry, <laughs> when you suggested it, Ad. So, mate, over to you. Give us your background of um, your memories and things to it. Well, you know, so I, I obviously dabble in filmmaking myself and um, every filmmaker has their inspirations in their life and those films, that, those powerful films that you see at a young age, which kind of changed the way. I mean, Martin Scorsese had like... Um, D.W. Griffith Westerns and uh, people like John Ford films and stuff. And I had, you know, the epic that is bingo. Uh, <laughs> basically, long and short, um, just a videotape I had, probably one of the first VHS tapes I had when I was a kid. Watched it to death, because when you're a kid, you'll watch anything around the house. And uh, we were talking after the last recording, one of the last recordings we did, and you said, we were talking about like those films you just remember watching nonstop when you were a kid. And this just popped into my mind, and um, I thought I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. Uh, and also, I remember you guys did the boy bucket fly once, and I thought, well, they're not, they're not privy to doing obscure eighties and nineties <laughs> comedy stroke whatever. So I thought, oh, I'll chuck Bingo their way, and uh, here we are. How old were you when you watched Bingo? Um, I would, have, I, would have, I would have been around about five years old when I first saw it. It would have been one of the first tapes I ever had as a kid. I remember I probably watched it quite often. Up until I was probably around 10 or something. Right, so just to let everyone know who's listening, that's the kind of audience that that, that the film is playing to. Well, so I've got a question on this, and I'll, I won't ask you now, but I'll come to it in a moment. Um, so when's the last time you you did watch this film, Ad? I would have been a kid, like, at a, at a push, like, 11 or 10, maybe a bit younger, but... It's stuck in my mind. Like it's it's oh it's the theme song has always been in my mind. Like as soon as I remember the film, that opening song, I knew about bit beat beat. Prodigal contest. I was singing that around the house before we started watching it. <laughs> so, Rob, what about you? A any memories of it? Do you have any sort of idea what it was before it was suggested? No, I'm in the same camp as you, mate. I didn't have a clue what it was. I, when Adam said bingo, I want us to watch a film called Bingo, part of me thought it might have been some sort of animal adventure film, just because of the name. I mean, it's not going to be a film about the game, is it? <laughs> that would be great. Imagine a, a dark, seedy underworld. Bingo I had, uh, Yeah, I had, I had some sort of feeling it might have been an animal adventure film, but no, I, I didn't have a clue what we were, I wonder if we were getting that. ourselves in for. Yeah, I wonder if it passed up a day by... Maybe, yeah. Maybe it was an Ebervale film. <laughs> it would have been it would have been one I had for Christmas, because I remember every Christmas I used to have well, everyone did, didn't they, back in the day? But uh, I'd always have like you'd always have VHS tapes for Christmas. And I I have this vague memory of having it for Christmas Day. I can just remember having it as a probably with something like Bambi and stuff like that. This came out in ninety one, right? So me and Prague would have been ten then. So there might have been a possibility of us going to the cinema to watch it. Time it would have come out on VHS, it, you know, brand new, we would have been about 11. So maybe it just missed us in the sense that we were just a little bit too old for it. The other thing is as well, I know you're going to go over it later possibly, but if you look at the box office, it, it did nothing. So yeah, part right. of me wonders whether it was ever released theatrically in the UK. I, and you've got to remember, right, we didn't really have a local big cinema growing up. So... No. There was a big chunk of my childhood. In order to go to the cinema, we would have had to travel to Cardiff or to Swansea, and that's you know that's quite a distance. You know, forty minutes, forty-five minutes in a car. So it, it could have been the case. Yeah, it, it was just one of those things. Circumstances meant that it we, we it passed us by. Can I say as well, for the record, I thought when I was watching it, oh God, this is just trying to cash in on the. Beethoven and Homeward Bound type of films. It came out before both of them. Here's a question, and you might be able to quickly Google it. Did it come out before Turner and Hooch? 
No, Turner and Hooch was 80s. Yeah. Well, I would say the film to compare it to is Beethoven. I thought it was like a knockoff of Beethoven. So the question I was going to ask you, is this a spoof or a parody film? Just one quickly. It came, it came up before Beethoven as well. That's what I said, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was just quickly I was just quickly checking something then. I can't believe it came up before Beethoven. I always thought this was a coffee cat of Beethoven. No, Beethoven was about 93, was it? 92, and yeah. Homeward Bound was 93. Uh, I I get why you're asking that, Ad, because, and because as adults watching it, certainly me today, I was, part of me was hiding behind a pillow because of how cringy it was, and then other parts, I was laughing to myself because of, I couldn't figure out if it was just really, really bad or really, really funny, but not funny on purpose. <laughs> there was just some things in it which I thought there's comedy and then there's slapstick comedy. And this was definitely the far end of it as regards to parody. There were some things in it that wouldn't look out of place in Hot Shots or Naked Gun. Well, this is it. See, I, th- I think, right? And I, this is, I'm going to give, this is where I'm going to give Bingo some credit, right? I think inside that film is actually a very funny comedy if they decided to forgo the kids' film genre and just gone for it. Right, I've got a point on this. The adult themes within the film itself, right? Because I had a question, is it a kids' film? So you, at the very beginning, you've got the kid, the main kid in it. Is he Chucky? Chucky, yeah. Yeah? Chucky and Chicky. Chicky, yeah, I re- really threw me that in. Anyway, he says, holy shit, right at the yeah. beginning of the film. He gives the middle finger. He's reading Penthouse mm-hmm. at, at one point. The, the scene with the dog sex with a bottle yeah. of champagne. Yep. Um, he says to his parents when they're leaving to go to, the, to Green Bay, stop the damn car. The dog meat scene. The shooting of the criminals at um, by the police at, while they're holding the dog. Mm-hmm. The knife fight in prison. Yep. And then they try and blow up a kid with a bomb. And I was thinking, fuck me, this is a dark, dark um, kids film. Just quickly, but I'm, I've got a lot to say about that bomb scene, but I'll wait till we get to it. There is so much to unpack <laughs> with that bit. But uh, yeah, well, I was thinking this myself. Um, I think it is a kids' film, but I just think back in the day, kids' films, they just had a bit more bite to them. They had a bit more grit uh, going on. Because um, a lot of the kids' films I remember watching when I was a kid is, to me, Gremlins is a kids' film. But it's like a 15. Like, I've always watched that as a kid on ITV at like two in the afternoon at, on Christmas time. Yeah, but hang on, no, Ad. We, we've delved a, a bit into your past and your history with what type of films you were watching. Yeah. But, when you were younger, and the ones that you shouldn't have been watching when you were younger. Yeah, but Gremlins used to be on daytime at Christmas time. It used to be on in like the afternoon, on Christmas Eve. It used to be on ATV One on Christmas Eve, and even edited down, that's still a messed up kids film. Are you sure it was on in the afternoon? Hundred percent, yeah. I swear down. There's an edited, is it? There's one hundred percent a PG edit of Gremlins out there. The same goes with Kindergarten Cop, uh, and that's a fifteen as well in its an edited. Form. Yeah, I no Kindergarten Cop. I will. Uh can see that I did see that on in the afternoon once. So I just think back in the day, kids' films they just had a bit more grit to them. Even like ET has a bit more grit to it than kids' films do now. Well, in, in I mean I said this a couple of times before. You look at Disney films from the when they were first releasing them to I'd say the eighties and nineties, they always had a couple of scenes in there that were either dark or quite grim in in terms of you know a, a big character dying and yeah I'm what, not going to cri- I'm not going to criticize this film bingo for the some of the adult content I just think it's I think it on the whole with this film it's mishandled um and I think they I think they caught I think the writers and makers are caught between the type of film they want it to be i.e. a kid's film, but the type of film it could have been, i.e. a very funny, over-the-top adult comedy. 
I do think as well, there's a really good story in there, potentially, for some sort of thriller or something. But, you know, the, the bit around the, the son of a professional footballer being kidnapped for, for him to throw a game. And I was just, I was thinking on it, you know, and, and the gambling as well. And again, I was thinking, Jesus Christ, there's another adult theme in it, but that would make a cracking film. And no doubt other people have done films similar to that. That section of the film is an absolute mess. Like, <laughs> I can't wait to get into that bit because once we start going into like what we change about the film, like, I actually thought the film chugged along okay. And I was like, oh, this is not too bad. This is just like a comedy kids film. The last half an hour is an absolute shit show. It's like anything goes to that point. It's like, what is going on? It's like they try, it's like they condensed three hours into 30 minutes or something. Yeah, it, it does feel like they had loads to put in there. And then they've, you know, they've just thrown the last few bits and I'll just get it in. It'll be fine. Let's just get it in. Yeah. But, um, look, it, it, it was an hour and a, and a half of my Friday night. And I wouldn't say it was a wasted evening. I, I, you know, I, I, all these films I do, even Short Circuit, which I panned when we came to review it, um, I enjoy doing them, or watching them, because I enjoy doing the podcast. But if, it wouldn't necessarily be a film now that I um, show to my kids when they grow up a little bit. <laughs> I think if you show this to your kids, they might, I wouldn't do it. I think it's like, I think it's like smoking a, a, a joint in front of your kids or something. I think it would kill their brain cells <laughs> or something. Um, it's yeah. definitely a film, yeah, like as Prog said, and as you've mentioned, Ad, that, that, you know, kids' films maybe just had a little bit more about them, and they were able to get away with a bit more back in the day. Let's put it that way. Oh, another one, Goonies. That's another one that gets away with a lot. Goonies. That's another one that just came to mind. But how much better is Goonies to bingo? Would you, would you, yeah, I wouldn't see there's as many sort of dark, scenes or uh, adult content in Goonies. I think with Goonies, it's just the, the peril aspect, isn't it, of the of the kids in that situation. I think, I always thought Goonies was quite a bit, was quite hard-edged when I was a kid. It's still a good film, like, you know, but... Uh, I mean, the only it, scene I would say with Goonies is the dead body. What about films like Bill and Ted? Well, uh, we've, well done a, we've done a film, one of my favourite kids' films, Watership Down. Oh, God, yeah, of course. Mind, remember that, remember again, I slapped on on Christmas Day? Yeah. When you were a kid? Yeah. What's the, what's the cute little bunny rabbits? He just like sat there, white like a sheet, and just horror, like it's disturbing. The other thing I'm going to mention just quickly, and I might come on to it later, is just the way the film looks, in in the sense of I, I it looked like a like a TV film. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? So like some of the sets or the, or or just maybe the the lighting, especially like when he first meets Bingo in the woods. It just felt like it was on a on a film lot, and it, if I don't know, it, it felt like it was. I want to say cheaply made, but I don't mean cheap. I mean it probably had a tight budget. What, I think this was ten million dollars, yeah. which I can't even believe it's that much. Well, <laughs> well uh, I can't wait to. What I'm really looking forward to was getting into the um because I've been I I I got this thing back up now. I can't wait to, the director of the film, I can't wait to go through his career because boy, has he got some nuggets in his career, by the way. Well, come on, let, let's talk about him now because I've got one point about him and that is, this was his last film. Yeah. So I don't know if that says something about him or whether that was, you know, he was just coming to the end of his career. But go on, what other films has he done? Well, he helped, the scre- he helped write the screenplay for Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> really? Oh, come on. <laughs> Go on IMDb right now. It's right there. I'm looking at it right now. Come Addi- on. Additional story for and uh, Close Encounters. Additional story. You know as well as I do that that could have been he just wrote a paragraph. Hey, would you... You love that film. Close I know I do. That's right? why I don't want him on it. He's a, he, he did something for him. He's involved in Close Encounters. <laughs> he worked on it. You know as well as I do that story credit means... That, par- that paragraph could have been the... Famous scene when the UFO comes down and the kid sees it. That could have been what he wrote. I'll, I'll give him. I'll give him one thing. Like he has been involved in the writing of some decent films. I will give him that. Like he did mimic. Yeah, that's a decent film. Batteries not included. Swimming in the sewers, right? 
battery's not included. He That's was involved. Oh, all right. Uh, he was involved in the Guillermo del Toro film Crimson Peak, which I quite mm-hmm. like. Uh, and he's also been involved in the re- remake of Pinocchio. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not disparaging him. I'm just saying when you give someone story credit, it's, it doesn't mean a lot. It, but all I'm saying, like right now. Close Encounters, it could have been Spielberg being like, yeah, I'm making this drama or something. And he could have said to Spielberg, i got a story idea for you. What have you made about aliens? We're going to give Close Encounters <laughs> to Matthew Robbins rather than Steven Spielberg. That's what but, we're going to do I, on this podcast. I, I know I, what happened. I know what happened. Honestly, right? So Close Encounters, he went to Steven Spielberg. He says, I've got an idea for a film. And what he did, he pitched batteries not included. And then I reckon Steven Spielberg took an element of that and just made it into Close Encounters. So not I, only... I was after a the- theory. So, so, he was, only... so hang on, no, hang on. He was sitting on he was sitting on batteries not included for 10 years. If 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 Andrew's theory is correct, if it wasn't for Michael Robbins, there would be no close encounters at the third kind. Oh boys, come on now. Come on now. Everyone goes on about Spielberg. <laughs> Robbins all the time. <laughs> yep. Spielberg I... wouldn't be anywhere without Matthew Robbins. <laughs> he wouldn't be, no. He... <laughs> uh... he was also involved with he was also involved with TH ele- THX eleven thirty eight. So is that that's George Lucas, right? Yeah, if so basically give him Star Wars as well while we're at it. <laughs> and Jaws, he's an uncredited writer on Jaws as well. He, he did the best shark. Oh, sorry, what was it? Ad, the, the second best shark film ever. One of the best shark films ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's in the top 17. <laughs> yeah. He's done some big things. He's, well, he's, he's been he's, involved in some big things. Yeah. His impact on his footprint on cinema is huge. <laughs> Where does Bingo in our footprint then? Um, around about the little toe. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's move on. Let's go back to bingo and move on to favourite aspect. All right, I'll go first because I haven't got many. Um, I'm going to go with Kurt Fuller. <laughs> yeah. One of the supporting actors. He's very recognisable face, especially to uh, me, Andrew and Adam, or any fan of the 80s, uh, as he was in Ghostbusters 2, Red Heat, Running Man, those type of films. And yeah. uh, I, I actually think he's relatively funny in this film as well. He's... In Running Man, he is the guy who Arnie signs the contract on his back. Is that right? And then he puts so, he puts yeah. the pen in his back as he... Yeah. yeah, okay. I haven't seen Running Man for years, so I can't remember. But I remember, him obviously, from Ghostbusters 2. And also Scary Movie. Yeah. He's the cop. He's the cop. He's very. He's one of the funniest characters in Scary Movie 1 as well. He has got, right, one of those faces you just really recognise. And 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 even like if you were to see a picture of him now today, still really recognizable. He was in LA law for like 10 years, wasn't he? Something stupid like that. One of the um, really uh something really funny he's in, which uh, a lot of some of the listeners might never have heard of, is uh the people who made South Park made a six episode sitcom called That's My Bush in the early two thousands. And he's one of the characters in that, and he's amazing. So it's him working with South Park sort of style material and he's really funny in that as well so that's what Jack I, I think he, I think he's a good comedy actor he's great he's amazing he's great in Ghostbusters too he plays a yeah. brilliant arsehole in that and like uh, I, I think he's great I've always liked the guy uh, uh, any others Brock? yeah uh, the other thing I quite liked was the uh, intro music it, it give the it give the impression I was in for a zany comedy and then the um the circus performer starts bloody trying to shoot bingo. I know. <laughs> and that's when, that's when I just started thinking, Jesus Christ, this is going to get dark. Yeah. That's yeah. where the film starts going downhill. That's where the film starts going like, The moment that dog had the first flashback, I was out. Uh, that dog... That is the first flashback and not the only is there. <laughs> yeah, that dog is like more intelligent than, than most humans, according to that film. Uh, let's move on because I'm sure we'll get into all this in a minute. I'll, I'll just do my right, my favorite aspect, and there's not many. I will admit, um, I I, the, the, I did think, and I've mentioned it already. You take out all the stupid parts, 
there's potentially a good plot there. Yeah. Um, or as we have already mentioned, you dial it right up and it becomes a parody of those type of canine movies. And for me, it needed to be some, either one of them. Sorry, Andrew, just to kind of interject real quickly. What's weird about it, though, is that it's a parody of those type of films before any of those type of films were ever made. Yeah, I suppose. But I, I know of... I'm trying to think. There was a Disney-ish... Maybe it wasn't Disney. There was another dog film. I think that was Benji. Um, yeah. And there's another one, and I don't think it's Benji. Um, I'm not, maybe I'm, I'm hopefully not confusing them, but there's another one about a dog robot. And they're all sort of that similar storyline. And this is the same, right? It's an age-old story of there's a poor relation, and in this case, it's a dog who's less loved by the family and He's more or less told to go elsewhere or he finds an, another, you know, family to live with. And then it's, it's sort of mirrored by Chucky in the sense of his family don't really care about him. Because at the very beginning of the film, I couldn't work out whether his dad was his real dad or his stepdad or something. Because he cares nothing about that kid. Well, Adam brought this up a few times as we were watching it. He is the world's worst father. <laughs> Oh, and then towards the end, it's like he's his favourite son again. But like, I, I really like I try and concentrate and try and work out. Actually, is he his son? Because he doesn't care about him. His <laughs> son is like just just for the listeners who um, please um, to everyone listening to this, please don't watch this film and just let us t- spoil it for you because don't waste your time. Um, this dad just straight up, uh, his son is gone all night. Doesn't bat an eyelid. His mother's a bit like, his mother's a little bit concerned. She's a bit like, shall we call the cops? He's like, no, wait until the morning. Yeah. And, <laughs> it's that line, isn't it? He waits until the official sunrise, which is like 7.14 in the morning, until he calls the police. And his son is potentially halfway up a tree, about to be mauled by a brown bear or a black bear, or whatever bear it is. And it's just like, Jesus Christ. As a as a as, as a father yourself, Andrew, um, would you um, would you wait until seven fourteen a.m. if <laughs> not? If I lived in Bear Country, no. And also, this this kid Chicky, the brother, he saw him fall in the water. So Chicky's just having KFC in the house, just like, where's Chucky? And he's just like, face yeah, down in the pond. But, uh, it's all right. I basically left him in the woods. I heard a big splash, but I didn't check on him. <laughs> It, it, he'd be fine, I'm sure. He has a massive cut in his head on when he comes off the bike. But then next minute, the dog's like more or less molested him and taken his clothes off to hang hang up to dry. And then the cut is gone. The, it's, <laughs> it's brilliant in that sense. I'm going to wait till we get to the end and to point out some of the other dad's feelings as a parent because I really <laughs> am holding back here. But yeah, that dad... NSPCC or social services needs to give him a knock straight away. Uh, I, I've got a few things on the dad as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm mm. hopefully when you're well, there. Right then, Ad, come on. You were favourite aspects. It was your film. You must have a few. Uh, Even if Prog- they're like nostalgia goggles yeah. on. Watching, on. Prog- watching Prog's reaction to it was probably the best, the highlight of it for me because I sat in the room and watched it with Prog. He, lo- watch- he loves a dog film as well and he's such a dog lover. Yeah. He did turn to me after and go, can we get a dog, Ad? And I went, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm joking, but uh, no, it was just um, now it was really interesting watching it because I haven't seen it in so long since I was like 10, like that's like 22 years, let's say that. How much of it I kind of remembered as I was watching, I was going, Oh, yeah, this is about to happen. And some of the lines of dialogue came were coming back to me as I was because I must have watched it so much as a kid. So it was really in, for me, I it was interesting watching it because it was like a kind of a weird trip down memory lane, but I it wasn't, it was, but a lot of it was me being like, I can't believe it bad this film is i used to enjoy this so much as a kid this film is bad i was just like that most of the way through it. but i just, I just want to say it was that the kind of bad when it was kind of enjoyable to watch i just want to say that adam chose this film and he hasn't actually said anything about the film that he enjoyed things i enjoyed about the film it was a film <laughs> um it, it has that going for it um things happened um some of the dog poor shots did make me laugh my head off 
Like, is this this recurring thing where there's a constant thing where he just cuts the dog's paw pressing buttons? Can I can I say one thing? I just thought of that's actually a bonus. That's a good thing about this film. Well, I was never bored. No, I, I'll give it that as well. And I, I'll never watch this film again, admittedly. And I don't ever think it'll be on TV unless it's heavily edited. Well, I said I said the prog while watching it. We're probably the only two people in the world watching this film right now. Right. Hey, well, I physically bought it. So, Rich, what's his what? name? Richard, whatever his name is. No. What's, what's the director's name? Matthew Robbins. Matthew Robbins is rubbing his hands somewhere because he's probably had 20p of me time the royalties come through. Get, where did you get it from? Because I saw it online. It was like 20 quid on DVD. Oh, uh, no, I, I rented it. You know, Amazon oh, Prime. Oh, right. So, I, I, I £2.49. I looked it up on eBay. It was like 20 quid on eBay out of print copy. I was like, I'm not paying 20 quid for it. So <laughs> I um, I just got to stream with it and watch it that way. One other favourite aspect. There was there were a couple of bits that made me laugh because of like, but some of the bits that made me laugh were like the bit where um, the bit where Bingo is like, remember that scene where like he loses Chucky and he's just walking around sad in the town and he's on the pier looking at the sunset. Oh. I, did, I did laugh at that. That made me laugh a lot. Because, because they humanise the dog. Yeah. But they, I, I think they humanise him too much. Well, I think I think the intention was to humanise the dog so that the audience would care for the dog. What they didn't realise is, is that by humanising him, some of the scenes actually played out as laugh-out-loud comedy for the wrong reasons. Yeah, really good example, right? The dog... Meets the other dog, and takes a bottle of champagne, and has a night of um, promiscuous activity with it. With her, right? Yeah. Yeah. He then realizes, hangover. Oh shit! I'm about to leave with his family. I better go. So he goes running after them, and the bit I didn't get is he doesn't catch up with the family and gets pulled over by a cop, which makes him do a um, a um, sobriety test or whatever it's called and walk a straight line he's not even f-ing driving a car so and then he gives the dog a warning and i was just yeah. like at, at this point i was my head was blown and, that, and that's yeah. when i started asking is this a f-ing spoof because i, 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 I was, can't work it out i was just like what why is this cop doing this like <laughs> well, what's wrong with a drunk dog what's wrong with a drunk uh, dog is this? yeah and he's oh you smell of champagne Oh, yeah. And so, don't even get me started, right, on the court scene. Oh, uh, the court scene? No, Prog, you did laugh at the bit where the woman barked. You laughed at that. You laughed your head off at that bit. When the woman, they said, they said, can you read the quotes from the witness? There's a bit in there where the, the dog's on the stand. And um, they say, can you read a quote from the witness? And the little typist woman just goes, starts barking like a dog. And I Prog, didn't laugh at that. You laughed your head off. I no, I was hiding behind a pillow. Was I was laughing. Embarrassed. It was <laughs> basically a, a scene from Airplane or Naked Gun. It was hundred yeah. percent out of that oh, book. But I'm sorry. Um, now the other thing in that scene, right? So this is a to the to people who haven't seen it, there. This is a, this comes after like so. Bingo stops a kidnapping. No, he he saves his family that have been kidnapped by Kurt Butler and his and his robber friend. And then he gets put into court and the defence attorney somehow swings it. So Bingo is then shown to be the guilty person. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. He wasn't even on f***ing trial. He, he's given evidence and then he goes down as an accessory. But as Prague pointed out when we were watching it, the family are sat in the courtroom. Why don't they just say, Your Honour, we weren't kidnapped by a dog? <laughs> exactly. Like, what was going on in that scene? Like, I was like, what? And, and that's what I was getting to. They humanised the dog so much to then pigeonhole or shoehorn him into these scenes, which then make no sense. And then they send him to a human prison. Yeah. Like, and he's wearing the little prison outfit as well. <laughs> oh. uh, can we just say as well, I, I believe we moved on to what we would change now, haven't we? <laughs> I uh, would definitely moved on to what's bloody wrong with the film, yeah. Can I just say now that me and Adam, I googled how far it is from uh, Denver to Wisconsin, and it's it's roughly a thousand miles, which would take you about fifteen hours driving. So you can do that in two days, yeah, probably one night stopover. 
how much happens to that dog in two days? And not only that, right, but he's in jail on the second day and he gets a letter from the kid on the second day. So how does the kid know where he's in jail? And how does the letter get for it to him? The letter, um, which just him saying, please find me, Bingo, please find me. Why don't you just write where he is in the letter? Just say, I mean, first line of the letter, I'm in Wisconsin, this address. Yeah, but that's, he, doesn't, he doesn't give an address because he's not in Wisconsin yet, even though he should be because it's only two days yeah. gone. Yeah, because um, for, for the people... timeline is all over the place. But, but I, I, I thought with the letter, he starts reading it, and then the, the crooks rip the letter from Four Eyes, the, the, his cellmate. So he, he can't then read the rest of it. That's what I thought ha what happened. Oh, maybe, maybe they, they do rip it, yeah. But I, what I'm saying to Adam is he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't even have been able to write an address on the letter because when he sends the letter, he's staying in a motel. Because if you remember, I can't believe we're going this in depth on this, but if you remember when Bingo gets out of jail, when he somehow escapes, uh, he actually finds the post box that Chucky has sent the letter in, or he's posted the letter in. And even when he finds the post box, he's still got to get on a fucking bus to get to Wisconsin. Well, I. <laughs> This is the whole thing, right? He sniffs like every letterbox or postbox, whatever part of the world you're in, um, looking for it. And I was just like, what the fuck's happening here? I haven't got a clue what he's doing. <laughs> and he's like, and then there was like a trail back to the um, like sorting depot. And I, just, I, I, it really blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind. There's, there's, um, there's a lot wrong with this film. Can I give you my favorite scene? Go on. And, oh, on, yeah, I, sorry. I, I, and we've jumped around a bit, right? But I, I think it's, he goes to prison, right? And um, yeah, one, he's in a human prison. Don't really get that. Two, he's in the same prison as the guys that he potentially helped put away. Yeah. And then my favourite scene is, yeah, when they start, start getting the knives out. And yeah. it's not because it's a good scene. And it, it's probably that sort of crocodile Dundee moment and proper spoof as well, where one gets a knife out, oh, I got a bigger knife, and someone else gets a bigger knife out. Um, and that, I suppose, when I just burst out laughing, and I was just like, what the f*** is this? I, te I tell you another good thing in that scene, is where the, the guard comes in, and he doesn't say anything about the knives, he said, who's barking? <laughs> and all the prisoners are just keeping stum, trying to keep their, like, you know, nobody rats on each other, do they? Yeah. Plus, yeah, Bingo's the only dog there. Yeah. Oh. No, dog. There are some funny bits in there. The, the other one, right, In the, I, I found the prison part quite funny anyway, all of it, not just the knives. Do you know when they escape mm. and they're running through the like the courtyard? Yeah. But then they're having to, they're trying to avoid the lights. So they're yeah. running forward. There's a light coming forward. So he turns around and runs back. Um, and I, I did chuckle to myself on that one. I, I, I you know, I... I must admit. I, I laughed at the, again, this is Kurt Fuller now, when they're in the Winnebago and Bingo has let the family escape and Kurt Fuller's uh, partner says, we, or Kurt Fuller says to his partner, it's okay if the police are there because that's why we have hostages. And to check on the hostages, he actually knocks the door first before he opens it. <laughs> I found that quite a nice little touch. Um, around that scene, I did love the bit where Bingo phones 911 and where the operator can't understand him because he's just barking and he's a dog, he's, he just starts going, I guess, to the phone receiver and she immediately is like, it's Morse code. <laughs> Any anything where the paw comes into frame and it looks like it's reading or wiping a window or doing anything like that, I was laughing. But the bit where the it's just the paw touching the doorbell yeah. and stuff. It was just hilarious. Like right. When, when Bingo finds out where the kid's been kidnapped in the in the factory, the abandoned factory or wherever they happen to be. And he goes to a window and this paw comes on and is wiping the window clear so he can look oh, through. Right. 
I was gone. I was the, gone. Can we just say quickly though, uh, for people, this is going to come up soon, but uh, oh, please, that bit when they were, he was kidnapped pissed me off so much. I was angry. I was so pissed off at the film about that thing because it just, I like cheesy films and stuff, but this, it was just so, there was so many problems from every direction at that point. It was just kind of annoying to watch. Like, it was really bad. So at this point, I want to mention, before we go fully on the changes, although we are touching on them, the film did have an actor in it that I had previously slated in two films. I know, I know. So Adam wouldn't know this, but um, <laughs> Glenn's, what's his name? Sadiq? Sadiq, I think, yeah. Yeah. So he played, and if you don't know him, Associate Bob in Demolition Man. And he plays Otho, I think, in Beetlejuice. Yeah, he's the Beetlejuice guy, yeah. Yeah. Um, straight away, I was like, ah, oh, it's, it's, um, it's Associate Bob. And I thought he was quite good, didn't he? Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Considering that I, it's not that I didn't like him in those two other films. I just didn't like the parts he was playing. But I um, don't know what but I think you had some sort of vendetta against him. Well, m- maybe this is why in this film, I give him a little bit more grace. <laughs> but, um. I tell you what, that, that bit's dark, though, isn't it? Oh, dog God, meat, yeah. Killing the dogs. And then the dogs are, like, really turning it on them. And I thought at one point, are they going to turn them into sausages? And I, I was thinking, <laughs> this film is going to be really dark if it goes that, down that route. Yeah, but that's what you could have done if you'd gone all out. <laughs> they may as well. The, dog, like, the dogs are saving the hot dogs later on, then. But, like, that bit in the film was really dark, though, because I remember being, like, re-watching that, I was, like, the bit where they were making dogs into hot dogs, I was like, wow, you couldn't put down a kid's film now. They wouldn't put down a kid's film these days. I, I wonder, as a kid, if you realised what was happening. Yeah, I did. I, I completely knew that because um, when we were when I was rewatching it, I immediately was like, oh, yeah, they make, them into, they make the dogs into the food. I just remembered it straight away. Because Prog mm-hmm. said, Prog was like, why is the dogs locked up? I was like, oh, because they make them into hot dogs. I just told him straight away. It just came back. It said a lot of the films came back to me as it went on. And I just say now, everything Adam has said about me while watching the film has made me sound and look like a complete yet. <laughs> you didn't say ah a lot. You went ah at the dog quite often. <laughs> you stand up because Adam, what's happening here? And the thing goes ringing the doorbell. <laughs> Come on, then. Let's go on to changes. We've mentioned a few of them, or we've mentioned questions at the moment. Um, but come on, what, what oh, have you got? Um, everything, every scene. First off, get rid of the kid actor. The kid actor was, I'm sorry, but he was just great. Like Chucky. I got a question, right? He finds a dog. At no point does he question if that dog is an owner. He has a collar and he has yeah. a nameplate. And at no point does he think, oh, are you lost, boy? Do you want, you know, do you want to, me to help you find your owner? No, be a mind now. I do think that dog's the first like thing was ever shown him love though because his family hates him. Like that's wow. the I think I actually I actually think if his dad watched him fall face first in the pond, his dad would have left him there and drowned. I don't think his dad would have dragged him out of that water. Right. That's the most of a dick I think his dad is. I know Ad, you've got a few things about the dad, but can I ask one question? Why does he walk around barefoot? Oh, it's well, his kicking foot. Yeah but why should he should protect that with like all his might? He walks well, I- I thought he, it was because he injured his foot at first. I thought, oh, he's injured his foot. But then Prog was like, no, that's his kicking foot. So I always thought he just had a bad foot. And I was like, oh, he's not wearing a shoe for some reason. I actually, I, I, I took it that it was some sort of, because it's his kicking foot, he doesn't want to put anything on his foot apart from the boot he's going to kick with in the game. Do you think the reason he doesn't wear a shoe is just so they get that, they get that gag when he steps in dog poop? Possibly. Yeah, it's a what's the technical term? Is it a plot device? I don't really know whatever it is, but it's set up. It's a. It's, a, it's definitely. Sorry, a guys. It's a. It's a plop device. <laughs> a poop device. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just bizarre. Um, really, um, weirdly as well, obsessed with the. He's obsessed with the Denver Broncos, and then obviously the Green Bay Packers straight after. Uh, but me and Prog watched the end credits for some reason, and I noticed on the end credits when I said. Um, but it's, the end credits actually says it was bankrolled by NFL films. Can I just say, we didn't, we didn't watch the end credits for some reason. 
you didn't press stop and yeah. then started saying there's an end credit scene. I did oh, say can I, can I ask you about an end credit scene? Because I didn't have it, but what I read afterwards was that there was there was um, at the end of a film they announce a sequel. Is that what happens in the end credit scene? Um, no, no not really. I think I think it's just like a I, I that I know what you mean because um there was gonna be a sequel to it there, which was called what was the sequel gonna be called? Bingo's Bingo? Big Fix. Bingo's Big Fix, yeah. Um we can actually. T- I I wouldn't mind getting into what we think that film would have been about in a minute, but uh, I, I reckon he um he he de- 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 uh, develops a drug habit. <laughs> he, he becomes a drug mule. Or or a pimp. <laughs> well, I just I just left the end credits roll because I thought I didn't know think there was an end credits scene. I just thought maybe there is, um, especially with a film like that. Like there might be some sort of like callback joke or something, but uh, like maybe he would have gone back into the kennel with that. Build, that build dog or something. But, I, uh, I got a, I got a question, or more, it was an observation. Do you know when everyone is in the hospital with Bingo? Oh God, that's it. I, I, why he's in the hospital again? Not a clue. But um, everyone's in that hospital when he's in the bed. Um, where's the woman dog that he slept with? So, so that's not the problem. With it. That's not the only. Thing. I'm surprised you think that's the problem with that scene. Why? Oh, I'm so far gone with this film. I'm just asking whatever. That bit of the hospital, right? 50% of the people in that hospital are people that have tried to kill Bingo, or Bingo is put in prison, or Bingo is had eaten alive by dogs. Like, like the two guys that were just trying to kill him in the scene before were there, saying, well done, Bingo. Good dog. And I'm just like, what? Like, the what's the called? The dog killer guy is there. What is he there for? Like Bingo ruined his like livelihood by releasing all of his cattle or whatever. It makes no sense. The the guy whose TV career he ruins with the bulldogs is there. Ad, Bingo is in a hospital bed. <laughs> he's not at the vets. He's in a hospital bed. I know, but there's so much wrong with that. Like I was like, what? Like, why are they? What? It was like, oh, why would how? Just one last thing about Kurt Fodder and his mate, right? How did they get out of jail for that? Like, can you imagine going to the, like they lay you out of prison to go to a funeral and stuff? How did that go down? Hey, wardens, can I leave prison today with my mate and and unaccompanied? Because um, this dog, the dog that put me in jail, is in hospital. I think no, I think someone was with them. Either way, who's paying for that? Um, I- also, how do they get out of prison? In yeah. the middle of the film. Yeah, exactly. They go down for kidnap in a family, a mass robbery, and they do like two days in jail. In fact, why did Bingo even bother escaping from jail? He could have just sat there for an extra night and just been released. One of the real like thing that got on my tits. So whenever Bingo find or whenever Chucky finally ends up, what's the name of the this Green Bay? Or Wisconsin, or whatever it is. Yeah, right? He's playing for Green Bay Packers, and they're in yeah. Wisconsin. So Bingo gets to the town. What's the first thing he does? Oh, I know. I look in the yellow pages, or whatever the BT phone book, if he was in Britain, yes. and I will look up the family name, Hal, whatever his name is. Right. What? So much is wrong with this. One, Bingo can f- read. And the, and the paw, the fake paw comes into it, so a tick for prog. Secondly, they just moved there. How are they in the phone book? Is that, is that updated daily? I, I know. I know. I know. They, they, this has been in two days. Two or three days, by <laughs> so the way. So much happens. By the way, this is two, within this, two, within this like 72-hour window... Um, he's been to court and uh, served time in prison and lived with another family for a while. Oh, yeah, he lives with the, the family that um, that he oh, saves, doesn't he? Can I just say, like, in around this part of the film as well, um, I'm just going to say bomb scene. Let's just get into it. The, the kid that's, like, the kidnapping scene. Oh, my God. That bit of the film, like... The, the cop, like, the... Mu- so basically, right, Bingo, they, they try to get Bingo, but Chucky finds Kurt Fuller and his mates and stops them from kidnapping Bingo. And then for some reason, they realise, wait, this kid's dad is like the kicker for the Green Bay Packers. 
let's kidnap the kid and get a ransom. No, let's bet on the Green Bay Packers to lose and hold the kid ransom. And if his, if, and if his dad agrees to lose, we will release him. So we win this bet. It sounds, sorry, it is that convoluted and weird, right? They kidnap the kid. And then Bingo goes back to the house and says to the, says, tells Chicky his brother that he's there. And they, they just don't phone the police or anything. The mother just says, okay, our kid's been kidnapped. I have a kid of mine. Will you go and see if he's okay? Go to the go to the layer, go to the kidnapper's hideout and to check on your brother. Try not to get kidnapped yourself. Right, and that's the thing, that they go after the criminals. They don't search the building or go to the building and see if the kid is there. No. They know that the kid's there, but they won't send the fire department there at all. They're just like, yeah, the kid's there, but we we're just gonna catch these two guys. We'll just leave the kid there. Whilst the building's on fire and they've got a bomb in there. Just quickly, oh, as well, Prog pointed this out while we were watching it because he was having a look on his phone. Cindy Williams, who plays the mother, was originally going to be uh, Princess Leia. Yeah. Ah. She, she was in, uh, she was down to, I think she was in like the final auditions for Princess Leia as, in Star Wars. So. She, she was in, she, she was in the film American Graffiti. And when I, when I told Adam that, he said, well, it's a good thing she didn't get it because her career took off. <laughs> If she got it, she wouldn't have made bingo. Exactly. She's still acting now. She's she's act she's acting in something because like last year. I can land land. Oh, that's not a role, is it? Talk show guest. Mm. <laughs> if you haven't got an actual name, it's not a role, is it? Mm, it's not good, is it? <laughs> oh well, Cindy, you know. He'll make action figures if you want, baby. But do you think she had a face which looked really familiar, though? Yeah, I thought for a second she did look like a, a little bit now, like Kelly Preston. She reminded me of the girl from Save by the Bell. She had that sort of look to it. Um, remember Save by the Bell? Yeah, yeah. but which one? Uh, Tiffany, you know. Tiffany Thiessen. Amber Thiessen. Amber or Thiessen. are you on about the one that was in Showgirls? No, no, not her. Um, I think it's Tiffany. Elizabeth something is she, isn't she? I'll see I'll, as soon as I see it. Not the black one. Um, I want to <laughs> I'm say I'm glad it wasn't the black one. Elizabeth Shannon? Is... No, she's American Pie. Isn't she? No, that's Shannon Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She looked like a girl from Silver the Bell. She looked Elizabeth like... Berkeley, and that's the one. Berkeley, yeah, yeah. Which one are you on about now, Ad? I it's think you're on about. about... Tiff Tiffany Amber Thiessen, you're on about, is it? Yeah, I'm on about Tiff I, I meant Tiff Tiffany uh, Thiessen. Yeah. Oh, bless it. Well, can we do, can we do um, rewind the TV and just do the entire, every episode of Save for the <laughs> Oh, my God. Are you joking? How many episodes are there? And they, yes. Uh, and they released, uh, re-released there recently, haven't they? Oh, can you imagine doing that? Like, like a big, the, the biggest podcast ever. All 86 episodes are saved for the bell. Plus well, hang on. The college, no. Plus the colleges. In real time. Right, you've got, you have got two Saved by the Bell films. Really? Hawaiian, Hawaiian style and wedding in Las Vegas. Oh, my God. Uh, Andrew, uh, can we do uh, Saved for the Bell, Hawaiian style? <laughs> do whatever you want. <laughs> I, used oh. love, I used to love Saved for the Bell back in the day. That was such a good TV show. When I was younger, watch it now. It's not so good. Right, let's wrap this up. We've been talking nearly an hour <laughs> on a bloody dog film, which um, none of us, I don't think, enjoyed. So let, for that very reason, then let's ask a question. Adam, would you recommend? Um, if your friends do a film podcast <laughs> and one of them hates dogs and you want to wind him up, yes. If not, no. Frog? Uh... Well, I, I'm not a fan of animal films, as in when people treat animals like they're human beings. I just, it's never something I've enjoyed. Uh, and this film has not changed my mind. So, uh, no, I wouldn't recommend this film. If, they go, if they'd gone all in on the pastiche or spoof, the comedy elements, I, I think I would have enjoyed it. But because... In the back of my head, I knew for a fact it was trying to be this funny kids film. I was never, I was never in on it. All right, I wouldn't recommend. 
and I'll just leave it there for the very yeah. reasons you've probably said. Um, right, a couple of things before we wrap up. The budget was ten million pound. It returned eight point seven in the box office. Mm. I, apart from Adam, I don't know anyone else who would have bought this on VHS. So <laughs> I'm assuming it probably lost money overall. I don't think I've never met anyone else that's seen this film. <laughs> I did notice you put out on Facebook has anyone seen this and a couple of people went nah yeah people were like, no. I, I like the fact that you just wanted us to watch this you had people to talk to about it do you think Spielberg has watched it because let's be real now um, the director Matthew Robbins yeah his name was yeah obviously yeah. he's a instrumental in Spielberg's career and George Lucas's career do you reckon they went to the premiere and what do you reckon they thought of it I don't I, think they went to the premiere no I reckon they fell out because Robbins... Matthew Robbins wanted too much credit for uh, Close Encounters and THX one one nineteen or whatever. It's called. Yeah, it, no, Matthew Robbins is like guys. Like I've I started you guys up. If it weren't for me, there would be no Star Wars or Indiana Jones. Give me some more credit, and they're just like, no, nah, mate. Basically, nah, he go. wrote a film called Close Encounters of the Second Kind. <laughs> Spielberg stole it and ripped it off, and since that day they've never really spoken. We'll just call we'll call the screen, entire screenplay additional story, and uh, yeah. <laughs> right on that note, we're definitely going. Final yeah. question for me: I don't want an answer, but who ki- calls their kids Chucky and Chicky? I, I'm assuming. I, well, I, I'm I, well, I'm assuming one of them is, is Charles for Chucky. I don't know what Chicky is short for, but anyway, I don't want an answer on that. So, podcasts come out every Wednesday. Um, if you like what we do, hit us up on social media. If you want us to do a social, or if you want us to do a type of film in the future, just let us know. Okay, cheers all.